We'll start in about one minute. Thank you. Chris, Adam, Richard, come online, please. Thank you. I'm going to stop the music now. Thank you for joining us. Um, thank you, everyone uh, that have joined us today at the Access.Space uh, webinar. Uh, we will start in a few minutes uh, the uh, uh, opening of the uh, webinar itself with uh, Chris, uh, Richard, and Adam um, speaking on a panel uh, about insurance in general. Let me first uh, share with you a presentation from access.space and then we'll get on with the webinar. So let me just open up my presentation. Close down all the other screens I have. And if uh, the panelists can maybe uh, switch off their video, I can then present uh, the access.space presentation for about five to eight minutes. Uh, to the panelists, if you don't see my presentation, let me know. Um, do you see my screen, Chris? Um, I don't see your presentation. Okay, just let me go back to the video and then press share screen. I had this problem last week, but nobody was telling me anything, so now how about now? Yep. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today um, to this webinar. Um, uh, this is a set of webinars. This is the 11th week in a row uh, for which uh, we have put together uh, to help companies uh, in the space domain to continue their activities in the, irrespective of the COVID-19 uh, lockdown and, 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 and issues that they may face. Uh, so we have had so far 11 weeks in a row of presentations from different types of companies in the small satellite field. Um, so the webinar is to support them and also yourself that are watching as well. How do we proceed? Uh, today is gonna be a topical panel on insurance. Uh, the three panelists are going to drive the uh, discussion on, on the topic. Uh, they will have about 15 minutes to one hour to present their case, their issues, the solutions into the insurance issues. And then uh, we'll have a wrap up session of question and answers at the very end. So uh, anyone that has any questions, uh, please use the bottom, uh, at the bottom of your screen, there is a panel where you can write your question. Uh, we'll call upon you for the questions at the very end of the presentation. So everyone is muted. Uh, we may allow uh, one, or, or one or two people to speak up their questions. Uh, otherwise, uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, okay, so in terms of the webinar this week, we're going to have Chris Kunstadter uh, from AXA, Richard Parker from Assure Space, and Adam Starmer from Marsh. Um, I'll be your host. Um, in terms of the webinars, uh, this is the 11th week. Uh, next week, there'll be a Space in Africa panel. I hope you can join that as well. Uh, in about uh, two weeks, on, on the 1st or 2nd of July, we're going to have ADTI and New Neutron Star uh, presenting. I'm, I'm looking for a third panelist for that session. On the 14th, I'm organizing an orbit servicing propulsion and situational awareness panel as well. Um, so that those are uh, in the making. Uh, today's uh, participants, uh, before I started uh, with the broadcasting of this uh, webinar, we had 218 individuals uh, which registered to this panel from 35 different countries. Uh, if you look in fact at the statistics, uh, about 60% of those registered usually attend uh, the panel. Uh, here's a chart that shows that uh, uh, trend. Uh, so we have beaten the week week seventh 
uh, in terms of, of number of registrations. So we have 219 instead of 205 uh, for that week. In terms of type of attendees, uh, this week we have uh, many different companies of, with different uh, ranges of expertise. Uh, you'll see this from this chart as well as from different types of uh, people um, from senior management team uh, to their engineering or advisors uh, and, and so on. Uh, so we have a whole lot of range of people presenting, uh, sorry, attending and, and listening to the panel today, which is quite great. And from in the international organizations like the ITU, European Commission and so forth. Uh, Access Space Alliance, uh, three of us are directors of the, of the um, alliance, myself, Betty and, and Christian from Germany um, are the directors and co-founders. Um, you, you'll see that the Alliance is, is basically an, a non-for-profit association uh, for the small satellite sector. We, we started this off in March 2019, we're nearly over a year since we formed the Alliance. Uh, we now have more than 80, 80 companies actually, uh, not 76 as the slide says, but more than 80 companies now are uh, sort of members of the Alliance. Um, and uh, this is not an updated slide, of course. Um, these are their logos and names of the companies. I'll send out these slides after uh, the uh, webinar. You, you'll see it yourself. Uh, in terms of distribution of companies uh, from all over the world, uh, it's about one third from the UK, one third in Europe, and the other third is between the United States, most of it, and the rest of the world. Um, also, if you are a company that's uh, sponsoring students in internships or hiring people and you have opportunities, please let me know. I can share this with people that I know they're looking for jobs, especially in this very difficult time. Uh, so if you, if, you're, if, you are, uh, if you have those opportunities, please, please contact me and I will uh, distribute them to people I know that are in need uh, of those opportunities. So we'll start now with the uh, webinar itself, uh, and I'm gonna hand over to Chris uh, and the team uh, to present the panel. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And over to you, Chris, from now on. Thank you, thank you very much, Tony. <clears throat> so when I uh, first learned of Tony's webinars, I was very impressed with the panelists he chose, and I reached out to him to uh, do a webinar on space insurance. And ironically, he had already arranged one with uh, Miguel Calvete and Morton Paul, two of our very good friends in the, uh, in the business, as well as a representative from Deorbit. So when I reached out to Richard Parker and Adam Sturmer, we didn't want to simply um, uh, repeat the excellent content that Miguel and Morton provided, but rather focus on specific issues that we feel are important to those looking at risk management and insurance for space systems. So we'll each do a brief personal intro and describe the issues uh, that we'll be discussing. Then we'll each present for about 15 minutes and then uh, we'll have the Q&A. So to remind you of the value chain of where uh, Adam, Richard and I fit in the, um, in the ecosystem, the um, satellite operator is typically the buyer of insurance. They will appoint an insurance broker who will then approach the insurance companies, uh, AXA, Excel, AssureSpace and others. And there are about 30 or 35 companies around the world who do direct space insurance. So um, with that, I will um, stop sharing and um, uh, I will uh, turn, it, uh, turn it over to uh, Richard. Thanks, Chris. Uh, my name is Richard Parker. Thank you, Tony and Access Space for hosting this event and for inviting me to participate. I run Assure Space, which I founded in 2011. We provide space insurance. We're based in Bethesda, Maryland, and the company is owned by New York-based insurance company, Amtrust. I have about 35 years of experience in the space industry. I've been on the insurance side for about 15 years. Uh, before Assure Space, I was with a different version of AXA than Chris is with now. And prior to insurance, I spent 18 years manufacture Airbus at so Assure Space, we can provide this year up to 50 million in insurance capacity for any single risk. We renew our capacity every year. We have around 15 different capacity providers, all with excellent security. And we can insure almost any hardware in space. Um, like many insurers, our main product is the Launch Plus One product for geo-commercial satellites. This is a combined launch and in-orbit coverage for satellite owners and operators. 
but we can also cover satellite and launch vehicles separately and with partners at Lloyd's we can also cover pre-launch and post landing so a complete end-to-end -end solution um, so we have our geo product but today I'm going to talk about our, our Leo products and we have a lot of experience in Leo uh, we've done some fun stuff in Leo over the last 10 years we've done gecko habitats we did the first insurance of hardware inside the space station in 2012. We did satellite deployments from the ISS. So there's pictures of the spacecraft leaving the, the Japanese arm in 2014, that was us. Uh, we did the expandable module on the space station in 2016. And we're currently working with NASA to look at new science programs in LEO. So the focus today is for us is gonna be on LEO, but uh, I'm gonna hand over to Adam, who's gonna do his introduction. Great, thank you very much, Richard. Uh, so my name is Adam Sturmer. I work for Marsh, and more specifically, uh, Marsh Space Projects. So we are a global team um, with over 40 team members uh, across the, the world uh, from different backgrounds. We have brokers, engineers, uh, lawyers, claims specialists, but we're all very much space focused. Uh, so our role, as, as Chris pointed out in his slide, is really to help any client from across the world uh, in any sector of the space uh, industry to help manage their risks and to transact space insurance as and when required. Uh, from my side, I joined the team in London uh, on the technical engineering side in 2004 after a aeronautical and space engineering uh, masters. And then I moved on to the broking side and then in 2011, moved to the space team in uh, Singapore with Marsh uh, to work more with our Asian customers. And then in 2017, moved to New York uh, to do the same in, in the Americas. So I think since 2011, really, I've been predominantly very much client focused. And so for the slides today, that was the approach I was going to take in terms of looking at, uh, looking at the risk management and space from a client perspective. Um, as, as Chris mentioned, Miguel and Morton did, did a great job in summarizing the different insurance products. And so today I want to focus more on some kind of practical tips of uh, looking at the industry when approaching risk management and, and, and buying insurance with a particular focus on pricing. This seems to be an area where most clients focus on. And so we're going to talk about what influences the premium rates and more importantly, things you can do to try and bring the total costs of the premium down for the overall economics of the programs. So uh, that's really my focus today. Looking forward to it. Thank you, Tony. Uh, appreciate the opportunity and uh, speak again soon. Um, so over, over to Chris. So thank you. Thank you, Adam. Um, as I said, Chris Kunstadter, I'm the global head of space for AXA XL, which is a division of AXA, a large uh, international insurance company. <clears throat> um, AXA XL specializes in commercial property and casualty. And uh, the space team is, uh, we have five people all together in the New York area and in Paris. And uh, we offer pre-launch, launch, in orbit, uh, third party liability, really any type of coverage that applies to to space activities. We also are very involved in um, outreach and uh, advocacy with um, governments and uh, institutions. And I'll be talking about that today. I'll talk about some of the, the um, policy issues and some of the regulatory issues that we look at, particularly um, uh, feeding off of the, the discussion that, that Richard's gonna provide you about LEO and some of the things that are happening in LEO. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to Richard for his presentation. And Richard, I will bring up your, screen, your, uh, your chart. Great, thanks, Chris. Okay, so space insurance industry has several challenges. Um, as I said, we're gonna, I'm gonna focus on the challenges that are exclusive to the small site LEO environment. So we see a lot of uh, LEO opportunities for three reasons, actually, particularly in the US. So small sat owners typically require low amounts of insurance and geos. They cost lots less to build and launch. So if you're a US operator, you can find sufficient coverage in the US market without having to seek insurance overseas. If you're a US satellite manufacturer or a US launch vehicle, export control can restrict the export of technical information outside of the US. And small satellites tend to have shorter manufacturing durations. Therefore, they can rapidly deploy new satellites, 
but there's less time to procure insurance and often there's no dedicated risk manager with some smaller operations. So sometimes it's quicker and easier to purchase insurance in the US. Now that being said, anyone outside of the US, again, they're probably gonna purchase their insurance locally outside of the US. So it's sort of a, uh, swings and roundabouts for us, but there are many US based small satellite operators, manufacturers and launch vehicles. So for this reason, we do see a lot of um, small satellite opportunities. And at Shore Space, as I said, we have, we have quite a bit of experience on, on the small set side. Not as much experience as some, but you know, we, we certainly are, have been involved over the last decade. So as you can see on my slide, there's three areas, three challenges I really wanted to address today. And the first one is the technology on the small sat side. And you can really break that out into three areas, which is reliability, redundancy, and support. So my, our first challenge with the small satellite world is the sort of reliability. And to be honest, our experience has been mixed. Without naming any specific programs, we have paid claims on a number of small satellites over the past decade for a variety of reasons. We've had computer lockups, transmitter failures, software errors, thruster failures, and antennas incorrectly installed. So anyone keeping count, that was five different failures on five different small satellites that we've paid claims on in the last 10 years. So in each case, the failure was serious. We paid a claim. There was no corrective action. Nothing could be done. So I think, you know, from our experience we know that the hardware and software is less mature we see less heritage we see uh, lower durations in orbit life testing is limited we see greater use of off-the-shelf components versus flight proven components the approach is different than our, than our geo customers you know that's okay small satellites you know frequently fly, fly new technology by design they're quicker to build they have a shorter design life so it stands to reason that technology will evolve quicker, but it means we frequently see new hardware or hardware with little on orbit history. And you know, that's a challenge for us. The next issue is the reduced or limited, um, limited or no redundancy. Mass and volume are important constraints which can limit alternative units and subsystems. So we, you know, I fully understand that you know, often um, redundant systems are just not gonna be available. We also don't have automatic FDIR, fault detection, isolation and recovery systems. So often with the generally less telemetry, less fault detection systems, we might not even be aware that we have a problem on the spacecraft until the problem occurs. And then lastly, um, the lack of ground access. You know, the physics of LEO typically mean that the operators don't have constant access to the spacecraft. So when you do have anomaly occur, so you've got new hardware, you don't have a, a redundant system, you have limited tele telemetry, and when you have a problem, you're not, you don't have access to the spacecraft in which to correct it. You don't have access to the spacecraft constantly, so you can correct it. You might see that spacecraft for you know, 45 minutes every two or three hours, you might see it once a day, you know, it, it depends. None of these technology challenges are in themselves a showstopper for insurance. You know, many small satellite operators have acceptable technology approaches. They've been building and launching small satellites for years. And to be honest, risk differential is a good thing. We model our portfolio using a Monte Carlo approach, and it recognizes that each risk has a different level of risk and reward. So we thrive, all insurers, we thrive on risk. We thrive on evaluating risk, and we're happy to work with clients who can provide detailed insight into that technology. But that comes at a cost of time and effort, you know, working with insurers, working with brokers, um, you know, for our geo customers that can take anywhere up to 12 months and, and sometimes even longer, actually, for the more complicated programs. And I think what we tend to see on the small set market is a, is a very short timeline in, hey, I'm launching soon, let's buy some insurance, let's get this done. So my other issue, my, my second issue is collision risk. So a lot's been said on this topic in recent years, but not much has improved. In fact, I would say the collision risk is definitely increasing as the number of objects in LEO is increasing. So Greg Weiler, who is the recent CEO of OneWeb, he was interviewed in February just before OneWeb went bankrupt. And he's quoted as saying, the biggest dangers in this industry right now are financing and space debris. One second you are there, the next second you are not. Okay, so the one that killed him was the financing, 
but OneWeb is now bankrupt. There are 74 OneWeb satellites in orbit with an unknown future. Their competitor, Starlink, has now launched 540 satellites and thousands more are planned by multiple operators. It's gonna be an exciting time to watch all these developments over the next few years. Uh, it's gonna it's going to be really, really fascinating. However, existing operators are seeing an increase in collision alerts. So we've had some recent near misses, and you can just Google um, debris and, and near misses, and you know this is all in the public domain. So last September, ESA had to maneuver an Earth Science satellite away from a Starlink satellite, so two active spacecraft coming close, and they had to avoid each other. In the same month, two um, dead spacecraft, a 14 meter habitat, just missed a Cosmos satellite. Neither was able to move. Both were beyond the end of life. In January, a NASA satellite that was launched in 1983 came within meters of crashing into a US uh, Air Force satellite. So US versus US. One had an 18 meter boom. It was a, a gradient stabilization um, experiment and the other weighed a ton. So if these two spacecraft has hit each other, this would have been front page news and the debris produced would have been a major threat to other satellites. So there's about 15,000 space objects catalogued by the US Space Surveillance Network. I think this excludes the military programs which are not published. So this is a really, this is a global issue. And I think most experts will acknowledge the debris risk. But I think LEO has become a bit like the Wild West. We've got pioneers settling a new territory and they're saying, we need to ignore the environmental concerns for now because we've got this new industry with tremendous promise. So, you know, don't regulate us, leave us alone, it will be fine. And to be fair, regulatory rules, if they were going to be enforced, they would need to be enforced by the US, by the Europeans, by the Russian, the Chinese and the Indians. So I don't see uh, a regulatory environment coming anytime soon. Although that being said, the FCC has recently considered um, adding uh, some regular registry requirements to LEO. So, you know, we'll see what happens there. But I'm really concerned that collision risk is underestimated by the space industry, in particular by the space insurance industry. So I think the risk is real. Um, it's hard to measure. So, you know, when you know, insurers, we like to model, we like to come up with, uh, you know, our underlying risk of loss. And many in the industry and government have really tried to measure collision risk, but it's really complicated. So everyone doesn't want the generic risk of loss. They want their specific risk of loss, their specific risk of collision. And that depends, depends on your orbit, your inclination, your altitude, your eccentricity, as well as the ability of your satellite to maneuver, uh, the reliability of that satellite. You know, at what point might you lose control of that spacecraft? And then at the end of life, how long is it going to take for that spacecraft to, to uh, re-enter or deorbit? So I think, you know, for assure space, I believe we're the first insurer to announce that we're not offering insurance for certain LEO risks. We'll still cover launch to LEO. We'll still cover orbit raising. We'll do transportation to and from the space station but we're not providing insurance for risks that are just gonna sit in LEO for prolonged periods unless we have some sort of collision exclusion. It's a bold move. Um, I don't particularly like saying that we're restricting our business, but I think we need to draw attention to this particular issue. Um, I could easily decline LEO risks without any announcement. I could simply price ourselves out of the market. Space market is very competitive. Uh, I, could be, I could put my rates up, a couple of percent and I wouldn't get any LEO business at all. Um, but rightly or wrongly, we're trying to demonstrate some sort of leadership in the market just on this topic. So, you know, we're sort of communicating that um, until some sort of global rules of the world, of, of the road are adopted, um, I don't want to pay for a collision, especially if the satellite I was insuring was not at fault. So it's hit by debris that was produced from someone else who maybe wasn't acting responsibly. So I hope this issue, this issue gets addressed before a collision occurs instead of afterwards. I don't know when a collision is gonna occur. It could be this year, it could be next year. I think it's safe to say within the next five to 10 years, we're gonna see some sort of collision. And I would expect at that point, the insurance industry, if it paid a claim, would say, I'm sorry, but we're gonna exclude 
collision. So just like Assure Space is doing already. So I think we're just the first mover on that front. My last point is the economics of small sat insurance, which again is very challenging. So we see um, a lot of small sat operators are launching without insurance. It's hard to, it's hard to really get a, a grasp on that, that number because I don't know if the um, small sat operators are just buying insurance from my competitors and I don't see it because remember they need less insurance so they can often you know go to two or three other insurers and, and get that placement done but it's maybe that they're um they're not aware that insurance can be purchased maybe they don't have the budget to pay the premiums and maybe they underestimate the risk and they decide to self-insure and of course some of the particularly the large um, mega constellations they have a business model that can accept the risk of loss so they have a sufficient number of spacecraft that, that you know, they can continue the business after a loss. Um, as I said, the space insurance market is very competitive and especially so for low amounts of insurance. So an insurance policy in geo needing $300 million of cover is proportionally more expensive than one needing only 3 million of cover. So the greater the coverage, the more insurers you need to syndicate the placement and that pushes up the range. So I hope that the predicted new small set opportunities, the wave of new business continues. Um, I hope we see lots of new opportunities for all insurers. I have a really positive view on space. I've been doing it my entire career. I've watched the industry significantly reduce the cost of access to space. We've got lots of new small sat launch vehicles and even lots of new big launch vehicles that are gonna do ride share. So we're gonna see the cost of access to space drop. We've seen miniaturization of technology and we have a real need for global remote sensing and data across the globe. So I think we're gonna see lots of new business opportunities. So I think as the, as the Leo, the small sat industry continues to grow, it will be easier to address the technology and collision risk. Uh, the hardware will become more mature and proven, and this Wild West approach will make way for establishment of the rules of the road and will protect the LEO environment. So those are my three issues, my three issues, those are my three challenges when working um, in the small sat um, industry. Um, back to Chris, I think. Uh, yeah, I'll turn it over to Adam for his presentation now. Great, thank you, Chris and Richard. Uh, some good points there, Richard. Uh, let me just share the screen. Okay. So, okay, brilliant, thank you. So, um, in the introduction, I think we mentioned that a previous panel had uh, done a great job of summarizing the different space insurance products. Uh, so. We weren't going to go through all of that again, but just to come with some practical tips to approach the risk management and insurance, and also focus on, on the pricing. Um, I'm very conscious that there's a, a spread of customers who are watching um, from large corporates to the new space as well, but, uh, um, and, and other parts of the industry. So I'll try and keep the advice relatively generic, but we'll highlight specific points for the different sectors as we go. Um, I did see there was a, a lot of new space companies though, which is great. Uh, we've worked with a lot of startups, bring them through the, the process, and really on the new space side, you know, even from a personal perspective, uh, some of these programs are absolutely fascinating, uh, you know, very passionate people, and uh, you can't get uh, vicariously enthusiastic for them. So. Uh, we actually love this part of the business. Um, we have invested in some resources uh, to support that part of the industry, and we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, so to get into the slides, though, um, oh, we, we uh, can really skip this. I mean, Marshall McLennan, yes, is a gigantic company. Um, it has 17 billion revenue, which, to be fair, gives a little bit of stability and ability to put on those resources. But but our team are down here in Marsh in the insurance broking risk management. As we said, we're a global team, nine offices globally, uh, different disciplines uh, required to, to deliver the service and client focused. So in Chris's original um, diagram, we uh, act as a broker. We're 100% agent of the insured. We uh, represent customers' interests entirely against that of the, the insurers. So uh, really one team with the client. 
So uh, with that, uh, I, I ran through these slides last night and uh, it only took me about 45 minutes to get through them. So don't worry, I am definitely not gonna spend too much time on this one because realistically, most brokers and insurers have this type of risk management lifecycle chart. Um, but really, all of them at their core are, are very simple. Uh, you know, first, you need to identify your risk um, and then put in place actions to manage them as far as possible. And uh, what risk is remaining, basically, you either have to retain it or transfer it in the uh, form of insurance. So insurance really is, is the byproduct of the risk management process. Obviously, the main aim is to keep the cost down, to limit the amount of premium that you'll be spending and uh, the number of policies that you need in the first place. So I think the first kind of tip for the, the startups really is, you know, a lot of this stuff uh, you can do yourself. I mean, risk will be inherent in everything you do every day. Uh, you'll be thinking about it day and probably nights as well. So we found that putting just a bit of time around structuring those risks can really, um, really help. I uh, would recommend focusing on the four pillars here, strategic, operational, regulatory, financial risks. And, uh, you know, even maybe do a risk map yourself, you know, uh, with severity of event versus likelihood. And that will really help you pull out the key priorities with which to focus on. I would also recommend to start the process early. Obviously, the earlier you start the risk management process, then the uh, longer you have to put these mitigants in. Um, so uh, the, and this can really pay dividends. I mean, it's, to take an example, if looking at the contractual negotiation phase with the satellite manufacturers and the operators and re uh, reverse, if you're on the other side of the fence, you know, a bit of time and effort there, talking about the risk and indemnities in terms of the transfer of risk uh, can really, pay uh, a lot of dividends later when you're looking to buy the insurance because it should be in a more simple manner, maybe less exposure in the first place. So um, really, I think, you know, start the process early, uh, do a, a lot of this yourself. I mean, I suppose the larger uh, corporates will either have a risk manager or you may be a risk manager that have these expertise. And so these uh, may be in place already. Uh, and uh, certainly for those larger risk profiles, you know, we happily uh, help guide through that process. If you have any challenges, bring some benchmarking analysis, uh, help you kind of understand your financial tolerance to loss in terms of the cost of retaining that risk. And uh, we found certainly on, on some of the constellations, uh, some risk modeling can also be supportive where you're trying to actually understand the probability of failure across the different satellites and planes and, and orbit profiles versus. So um, this is certainly a, a key area, um, but inevitably at some point uh, you may realize that or, or decide that you want to buy insurance. And so uh, you, you've kind of got to that phase, you've worked out what your risks are and you want to insure. So, so what now? Well, yeah, of course, you know, feel free to call the, the broker, uh, but at the same time, you know, it's really about trying to understand your options. Um, you know, this chart was presented before, so we're not going to go through it in a lot of detail, but really the main takeaway is that for each party within the space uh, program, there is an insurance product available that will uh, insure the satellite throughout the program life. Uh, this is a chart from Chris actually, so thank you very much. Uh, he uh, has done a great job of breaking this down and um, we can see that most of it is focused on asset insurance. So if the satellite fails or the launch vehicle breaks, then you can uh, recoup your costs of replacement or, or um, fixing the satellite. But also these can be tailored to business interruption uh, exposures. So operational expenses of um, managing delays perhaps or, or con business continuity uh, exposures. They're predominantly linked to physical loss or damage. The one that we find is quite useful with startups is this contingent business interruption on the uh, satellite owner pre-launch phase. Um, you know, with the delayed revenue model that a lot of the space programs go through, your cash flow can be really critical, and this can help uh, manage that in the event of a delay caused by damage to the satellite or launch vehicle. 
I mean, that, that's insured in the pre-launch market, which has its own volatility. So the, the product is somewhat sporadic, but um, in its availability, but uh, it's certainly a good option. Um, I think I can cover off launch liability quite quickly because this is generally, for the most part, um, provided by the launch service provider. Depending on where you register your satellites, you may need to top up the limit of liability or extend in orbit. And you can either do that, uh, you know, ask the launch service provider if they have an option to do that or, or do it yourself. Um, so uh, that's relatively straightforward. I mean, we're going to uh, focus on the uh, launch insurance today, uh, but there are other types of corporate level insurance that can support programs as well, like uh, trade credit. Uh, if you have a, an anchor customer, you have concerns over the payments or a you know, uh, are fundamentally relying on a, a license, then there's political risks as well. So there are a multitude of options, but again, it's all about trying to reduce the amount of premium that you need to spend and maybe just spend more time with the finances that might be driving some of these requirements, you know, can, can, uh, can help as well. Um, <clears throat> so in the uh, small SAT world, if we're focusing on that, there are, uh, Chris mentioned 30 to 40 insurers. Uh, in the space market doing launch and orbit insurance, which is, um, is absolutely the case. But of that, really, only 10 to 12, say, are proactive in the small SAT segment, which isn't necessarily a problem because the values are so much lower. You need less insurers to do that. Um, but some of the insurers have come up with their own uh, policies. Uh, so AXA here have the, the seamless pre-launch and launch insurance policy. Uh, Morton uh, explained his Bifrost product and... Uh, you know, others, including um, Brit and Hiscox, have got Lyft, and, and there, are, there are plenty others. So it can be a bit confusing when you're looking at your options. And obviously, the broker can talk you through the differences in the, uh, the coverages there. Uh, one thing that we're doing at Marsh is um, we uh, have set up a, an internal kind of global new space team of 17 uh, people around the globe, uh, different, uh, different disciplines, to identify and support new space specifically. Uh, so uh, we, as part of that, are developing our own policy wording to give some kind of baseline and also developing some uh, material uh, to help uh, educate and also make each of the stages as, as, as smooth and efficient as possible. So we have a white paper that talks about the risks and uh, the, uh, the insurance and the risk management process a little bit more. So please feel free to get in contact. You can send that through and, and talk offline. Uh, there's no problem at all. For those of you who don't know, uh, reading about insurance is, is a, a surefire cure for insomnia. So I can send it through, put it by your bed, and uh, we can talk about it in the morning. But uh, in all seriousness, we, we find uh, the, the launch insurance probably to be the most interesting. So we're going to focus on that. It really can be used as a business enabler rather than just an unwanted cost. But the other reason for focusing is that on it is quite honestly, because it's the most expensive. Uh, it, it typically is the third or the fourth largest cost of a satellite program, and obviously a critical phase of the risk as well. So when looking at the pricing uh, for launching in orbit, uh, we've broken this down into external factors, which you can control, uh, which we can't control or outside of your control, and internal factors, which you have some level of uh, control over. Um, so in terms of external factors, then yes, of course, uh, the satellite health, if you have problems on your own satellite or you start building a satellite and similar satellites start failing in orbit, then that's going to affect your premium rating. But the one I want to focus on here is the recent market experience, because this is really where the volatility of the market uh, provides incredible challenges for, uh, uh, for our clients. Um, Chris is going to talk more about the market dynamics, but in summary, there's been around $1.2 billion of claims in the last um, 12 months, uh, as reported by Space Track. And we had uh, Space News, sorry. Um, and, and that's in comparison to about five or $600 uh, in premium. So upon that first failure in uh, July of last year of this series, the rates pretty much doubled overnight. And since then, we've had more losses, which has increased the prices even further. And that's obviously disastrous for our clients in terms of budgeting. It really, we do not underestimate the, the troubles that that puts our clients through. So uh, managing the volatility, actually I've got to start here. So 
uh, if you can see. Um, so obviously you can see the volatility, especially on the in orbit side here, you know, we've gone up two or three times, which is, uh, which is very challenging uh, for customers. So in terms of managing this uh, volatility, we uh, would recommend, you know, again, preparing early. If you're a small sat operator that just needs one or two insurers to buy the insurance, get into the market, see what the pricing is. If it fits with your budget, I recommend seriously considering taking it because we're at a point in the market now where any further losses are probably going to increase the rates further. Rates go down very slowly, but they go up quickly. So there's always that uh, benefit of going in early just to check that out. If you have a larger sum insured, a bigger program, then getting into the market early will give you the option to maybe buy just a percentage of your sum insured. And then perhaps you buy a little bit more later and you can kind of spot buy um, towards launch your up to your full sum insured and kind of normalize the volatility of the market. So that's, that's one way of we're managing it to a certain extent, but really a lot of it comes down to initial budgeting in the business plan. Please keep as much margin in terms of your premium budgeting as possible because the volatility in space insurance is very high. Um, in orbit renewals um, have less ability to uh, manage the timing of the placement because you have a fixed kind of termination and um, renewal date. So there really it's about being close to the, uh, keeping close to the market, maybe keeping agile on, on good quotations that come in for binding, um, again, budgeting, but also potentially maybe even consider combining multiple satellites if you have them for placement uh, for package or even a system level performance. If you can kind of break the insurers uh, away from thinking about the risk on a percentage increase basis and re-baseline their, their pricing expectations on a new coverage, that can help. But realistically, if you're looking for the same type of coverage that you had 12 months ago, there's not much you can do to get around the fact that you're gonna to need to pay more at the moment. So I think the volatility is, is a big issue and uh, the overall uh, amount as well, uh, which I think we're going to come on to uh, later, but uh, the amount, albeit okay, when you look at the average in comparison to the last few years, is, is very high. So that uh, can cause problems as well. But then if we're looking at the internal factors here, um, again, if you're a small SAT operator, then really, uh, and you're just looking for launch vehicle flight only insurance, and I think I saw one of the Q and A's come up for a Falcon already, you know, really, the, the pricing is going to be fundamentally driven by the launch vehicle that you select it's the risk during the launch phase is the launch vehicle it's not it's pretty agnostic to the choice of the satellite so uh, yes um, there are deployers and uh, different um, orbits they obviously have some implication but it's mainly the, the the launch vehicle choice but if you are a large satellite or you're looking for in orbit insurance then the choice of the satellite obviously becomes the main driver for the in-orbit phase of the price, uh, the risk that you're pricing or the insurer the pricing. So there, I think um, Richard alluded to, you know, some of the main factors, the heritage, uh, uh, margins, redundancy, and really it's about getting in front of the insurers and, and giving them as much information and detail about this as possible. The more they know, uh, the more comfortable they're going to be with the, uh, the, the risk profile and uh, it, it will, result uh, in, in, in lower rates. So, and that's especially true where you have uh, new technology because there even more education is required of the uh, insurers uh, to the insurers. It's, it's not car insurance, every policy is tailored to, to your own needs. So uh, it, it needs time with the insurers to develop the relationship on a personal level and to get them to understand the technology. The market has a great, um, history of supporting new technology, but there is a process and there is, a, there is an impact. If you look here, we've got the blue line that's talking, it shows the um, variance of the cheapest rate on the deal, cheapest insurer and the most expensive. <clears throat> and even for relatively large sums insured, the, the um, differential can be maybe plus or minus 5%. Well, for technically challenging risks, you know, that differential is uh, much wider, maybe 10 to 15% plus or minus. And so the more your um, sum insured is that the more you have to come up this steeper um, pricing uh, curve and essentially 
uh, it will result in um, <clears throat> higher higher premium rates for higher sums insured and on, on, on specifically on new technology. So again, if we can kind of uh, balance this out, uh, that makes a big difference. And, and as the market becomes tougher and harder, then really the pricing differential for some insured increases uh, as well. So we're seeing greater ranges, even on the better risk profiles at the moment as well. So management of the sum insured is also a key part of the strategy. Um, and I don't want to take up too much time. So I will just finish with the coverage requirements. I mean, this is really where you get the value for your premium. Um, there are ways that you can try and save money here if you're looking to reduce some of the cost. We find that on an individual satellite insurance basis, the reduction in premium that you get for the level of risk retention is not quite reflective of that risk that you're having to keep. Um, but certainly it is an option and as is um, potentially looking to restructure the coverage, uh, maybe if you have multiple satellites, uh, you can put in more sophisticated kind of layers of risk retention and maybe get some better value there. Um, but really, um, there are plenty of options. I mean, the coverage for the launch insurance is very wide anyway. It's all risks insurance. So unless it's specifically excluded, then it should be covered. But uh, there are ways of looking at this to try and uh, keep the overall project costs down. So um, I think those were the main points that I, I kind of wanted to bring out here. And so I, I can pass back to Chris. Really, the, the main takeaways are prepare early, both in the risk management phase and the insurance phase, and, and really spend time, spend time with insurers, uh, with the brokers, understanding your risk and, 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 and getting an insurance structure that meets your overall uh, risk tolerance as far as possible. Um, and look forward to talking more later. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, over to you, Chris. Thanks, Adam. If you want to stop sharing your screen up at the top, that'd be great. Um, perfect. So um, let me talk a little bit about some of the, some different types of issues. A lot of this has been covered already by Richard and uh, by Adam. Um, but the, 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 the key point that I want to make is that space insurance is very critical to innovation and investment. What does that mean? That means that a lot of investment would never happen were there no insurance to cover space risks. So space insurance allows companies to take risks and know that if they have failures, you know, as long as we're, we're comfortable with uh, insuring them, that they can innovate and they can get investment. At AXA XL, we, I like to say we embrace risk. Uh, what does that mean? That means that we like to find a way to ensure um, even, even non-traditional risks. So um, Richard talked about the work he's done in LEO. Um, we've, uh, we're actually the market le leader in um, small sat insurance. We have over 90% market share in uh, small sats. Um, uh, having insured hundreds and hundreds of them for launch vehicle flight and many for uh, on-orbit operations. Um, I like, uh, we innovate also. Adam mentioned the seamless coverage that we provide. What we found was that satellite, small sat manufacturers and operators would have uh, a, um, uh, a difficult time buying insurance for the transportation of their satellite from the factory to the launch site and, and installing it on the launch vehicle. So we developed a essentially a, uh, a policy that goes, as we say, from loading dock to orbit and um, will ensure the satellite during the transportation, during the uh, integration with the launch vehicle and during launch vehicle flight up to orbit. Um, and finally, we encourage responsible behavior in space. I'll have a lot more to say about that shortly, but it, that's something that we feel is a very key element. Uh, Richard talked uh, quite a bit about the issues in LEO, the collision risk, and we find that that really does need to be addressed and does need to be, um, um, uh, you know, it, it is very challenging for us. In terms of principles of insurance, of space insurance, we've talked a lot about that. I don't need to cover these. We do take virtually all the risk from launch onwards, and as Adam said, it is the third largest program cost. So it's a significant, uh, significant cost for satellite owners, operators, manufacturers, launch providers. Uh, Richard talked about some of the changing uh, space industry dynamics, obviously small satellites and large constellations. 
it's very easy for a, a, a company who wants to launch, um, say they want to have a, a constellation of um, a thousand satellites, they can launch 1100 of them. And uh, if 100 of them fail, they still have their thousand. So in, they essentially self-insure on, on many of the larger constellations. Uh, obviously, technology is changing. Um, insurance is very volatile, as, as Adam said. I've got some charts on that. And the large range of insured values, uh, Richard touched briefly on that, but with a, a market capacity in the, say, $600 million or so, there's $600 million of capital in the space insurance market. So certainly for the largest risks, that full amount of capital is needed. But for small risks, small launch vehicles, small satellites, um, there, it, it is more competitive because they don't need quite as much um, capacity for that. A couple of interesting statistics for 2020. To date, um, the number of launches is the highest it's been in the last 10, uh, 10 11 years, um, uh, except for 2018. So it's the, there have been more launches this year than any other year in the last 11, uh, 10, except for 2018. And yet the insurance premium is the lowest it's been in that same period. So what we're seeing is the effect of um, fewer insured launches this year with the deployment of the Starlink constellation, but also the effects of uh, the COVID um, with a number of launch sites uh, being um, locked down for the time being. That will change. The slope of that line will increase, but we're looking at a total premium this year, probably in a similar range to where it was in 2018 and 2019, maybe even slightly less. So it'll be an interesting year for us, a bit of a challenging year, uh, but a, a pretty exciting year. There's a lot going on. If we look at the premiums and losses over the last uh, 20 years, uh, we see that from 2002 to 2012, the premium, the blue bars, ranged from $750 million to a billion dollars a year which was certainly sufficient to pay even the largest, the worst years, uh, 2007, as an example. But since 2012, pricing has come down by about 50%. And as a result, the, uh, the amount of premium in the market is not sufficient to pay the losses we've seen. Now you see 2019 there, the losses in 2019 were not out of family. They were in family with 2013, 2007, 2001. So uh, the result of that was that a number of insurance companies pulled out of the, uh, the business, the capacity decreased, and, and pricing being a function of, of capacity or capital, um, pricing did increase. In fact, the pricing has uh, doubled, tripled, even quadrupled in some cases. So this, the business is profitable if it's priced correctly. Does that mean that prices need to go up? Yes, it does. It means prices need to go up. As I said, the premium in 2020 will probably not be um, um, anything more than, say, $500 million or so, uh, depending on how quickly things get rolling. But um, we need to get that premium back up to, to a sustainable level because we know what the peak loss years can be. And these are just, uh, you can see four of the peak loss years, but we've seen years when losses have been almost uh, $2 billion. So we need to be ready for that. <clears throat> uh, if we look at pricing, Adam showed a similar version of this chart. You can see that um, uh, the pricing hit a peak in 2003, 2004. And, and, and hit the bottom into 2018, 2019. Prices since then have increased significantly, but they've only increased to where they were, say, six or seven years ago. They haven't gone back, obviously, to the level they were at, uh, say, 15 years or so ago. So the increase uh, does affect the buyers of space insurance, but it's important to recognize that in order to maintain a sustainable market, we need to have pricing that covers the expected losses. So let's talk a little bit about uh, policy issues. There are many, many organizations who are looking at uh, responsible space activity. And when I say responsible space activity, I mean um, cleaning up after yourself, not leaving a uh, mess in orbit and making sure that, that space is available for everyone to use. There are various levels of, um, of compliance and levels of uh, bars that people need to, to reach. The, the lowest being regulations and licensing. In order to get a license to launch a satellite or, or a launch vehicle, you need to meet a certain minimum set of requirements. Um, and, and that means you then get the license. But that's just the, uh, 
that's just the, the, the minimum acceptable level of responsibility. Next would come things like best practices, standards, guidelines, uh, what have you. And there are a lot of organizations working on those, uh, those types of um, issues. Um, everything from AIAA to um, uh, other industry groups, um, government uh, agencies here, uh, here and abroad. We're trying to figure out a way to develop pra best practices and standards that will make space even more uh, safe for people to use. And then finally, there's an interesting effort by the World Economic Forum called the Space Sustainability Rating which is almost like uh, what we have here in the US, a LEED rating, which is given to um, building, uh, buildings for their compliance with uh, very high levels of, um, of greenness, if you will. So this rating is in development. It'll take a few years to roll out, but it, it'll basically be something that a, 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 an organization can, can show as we are doing more than just the baseline. So what are some of the things that we at AXA XL are very, uh, very big on? One of them is uh, post-mission disposal. We believe very strongly that the, the current guideline that says 25 years after the uh, end of your operational life, your object needs to be out of, uh, out of its orbit, either deorbited and burn up in the atmosphere or move to a, uh, a disposal orbit. We feel that 25 years should be reduced. And the reason for that is that that 25 year rule came about about 25 years ago when there was a lot less space activity. Today, there's just so much more activity, so many more launches. It's interesting this year, there have been more satellites launched just through today than there have in any previous year uh, on record. Um, and we're not even halfway through the year. So there's just so much more activity. We really need to make space um, accessible and safe for people to operate in. So big believers in post-mission disposal and a number of organizations are working on that. We also believe in, in having uh, beacons and propulsion on satellites, beacons for positive identification. We recognize some people may not wanna put beacons on their satellites for whatever reason, but we believe that every satellite and every rocket body that's left in orbit should have a beacon on it with a unique identifier so that it's easily tracked and easily uh, there's an there's a easy chain of custody for it. Propulsion for collision avoidance, propulsion for uh, end of life disposal, um, very important. And propulsion used to be a very um, complex, very large system on satellites. Now there are some very uh, elegant solutions that are fairly inexpensive and fairly small that you can even use on, say, a 3U CubeSat. Um, finally, on-orbit inspection and repair and active debris removal. Um, we're very involved in some uh, organizations like CONFERS, where we're trying to come up with standards and best practices for on-orbit uh, servicing. What we found was of the uh, 85 or so geo satellites launched since 2000 that had significant anomalies on them, about 60 of them would have benefited from on-orbit inspection. Just being able to go up and see what was wrong with the satellite, what happened, what broke. Not so much for us as insurers, but for the satellite manufacturer to make sure that they can fix that problem and uh, not have it happen again. And for the satellite operator, so they know then how to um, take care of that, uh, that issue. So as an insurance company, we actually have some levers and knobs we can use to incentivize good behavior. And we really like to think that we can encourage organizations, companies, satellite operators, and what have you, to be role models, to do the right thing, not simply because uh, you have to, but because you want to show your responsibility. We work with several clients who are very proud of the fact that they go beyond merely the baseline of uh, responsibility and uh, are, are, are quite a bit more uh, diligent about, about what they do in space. So bottom line, responsible behavior is the baseline. It's, it's not what you aspire to. That's the minimum that you get to. Then what you want to do is um, um, go beyond that, do what's good for the environment. Don't leave a mess, clean up behind, after yourself and don't leave anything in orbit. So finally, uh, as I said at the beginning, space insurance is a very critical enabler for, for our industry. And without it, there would be a lot less investment, whether it's in LEO startups or big geo programs. Um, so it's, it's a very important part of our business. We have suffered 
quite significant losses over the past several years. Um, we've had, uh, since 2018 as an example, we've had $1.1 billion of premium and $1.6 billion of losses. So that's not a, that's not a sustainable model. Um, as a result, insurance companies have become more uh, conservative and uh, they, they, they're trying to find ways to reduce this volatility. So in terms of responsibility, we work very closely with industry, with governments, with institutions, and with our uh, colleagues, competitors, and everyone else in the business. We want to have smart clients. We want to have smart brokers, smart competitors. We want everyone to do the right things. So we're leading the uh, insurance market. We feel we're leading the insurance market in, in returning to uh, profitability and responsibility in space. And I'll turn it uh, over to the Q&A. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Adam and Richard. Uh, thank you so much. Very interesting topics. Uh, maybe you can come online, all of all three of you. Uh, Chris, I think it's up to you now to uh, manage the Q and A session and also other potential uh, discussions and chats. Uh, there's a Q and A uh, window at the very bottom. Um, there's a lot of people. About 16 different uh, questions already been asked. Quite a lot. We have an, half an hour, basically, on our time to answer all of them, plus others, basically. If you, if you don't Good. mind going through the Excellent. questions, you can see them yourselves. Uh, the three of you can see them if you open them up. Uh, and then one by one, Chris, I'll, I'll allow you to do that. Okay. Take care. Sure. And I'll try to, I'll try to combine questions if I see that there, there's commonality in, in what people are asking. You know, people do often ask about the pricing of insurance, and it's always... Uh, very difficult to to give pricing in a forum like this because we need to do our due diligence. We need to understand the technical risks, the the business risks, and so on. So we we won't be answering any specific pricing issues today, but we encourage you to work with us uh, into the future. Um, you know, we you can figure out what the failure rates of launch vehicles are. That's all public information, um, and that gives you sort of a the the technical gate that that we need to get through. One of the interesting things about pricing is that there's a compression of pricing. In other words, the best risks probably pay too much and the worst risks probably pay too little um, based on their pure technical um, uh, issues. But that's because we write a portfolio of business. And if we were to price everything purely on the uh, historical failure rates, that would not, be, uh, uh, that would not work for many clients. Um, so okay. there is this compression of pricing, but that actually helps us to be able to write a portfolio of, uh, of risks. Um, so there's a question here regarding collision risk. How can the insurance industry be a supporting force in driving responsible behavior? Uh, Richard, do you want to talk about that, um, given your concerns about the uh, collision risk? Yeah, it's, it's challenging. I think some of the points you mentioned, you know, with propulsion systems and deorbiting and, and cleaning up after yourself and all, the, all these good things, I think those are out there and there are a number of organizations that are promoting that. I feel a little bit uh, unable to really move the dial. As an individual insurer, what can I actually do? I support everything that you said. I support you know, other organizations participating in this type of forum. We do a lot of networking. We do a lot within the, the Washington DC community on this issue, but ultimately, what can I do? I've taken the step of saying, I'm really worried about collision risk to the point where I'm actually pulling back because of the collision risk. So it's, it's, it's tough. I mean, um, and we're, a, we're a single market in a, in a very big ocean of uh, the industry. Um, I'm afraid it's probably going to be we have a collision and then everyone will do something about it. Let me ask you, uh, uh, Richard, uh, there are a couple of questions that sort of work together. So maybe you can talk about it. Uh, mm -hmm. One question is how receptive have clients been so far to a collision exclusion? And then a second question, what do you do about um, attribution? How do you determine if a failure was due to a collision and therefore would be excluded under that? Okay, so we've really only started really raising this red flag about collision risk probably since the beginning of this year. You know, and a, and a lot of it is to differentiate ourselves to our capacity providers. You know, to be honest, I would I would love to be able to uh, write insurance for everyone, for every single approach we get and, and get, you know, get, get, you know, have a sell insurance on a volume basis rather than being selective and build a portfolio. But that's not what we do. We are very selective. 
we are the um, we are the the fund end of the of the mutual fund world. You know, we we believe we can pick and choose the risks to build a portfolio to have the right approach. So, how have people been <laughs> receptive? They're not receptive to it because. To be honest, they can go to you, they can go to any other insurer in the US, and if you've got a fairly low sum insured, you can get your placement done. Um, I, was, I was interested to hear that Adam, Adam said, you know, maybe there was only uh, 10 insurers that are doing the small site business. I thought there would be more than that, actually. I thought there were, there were definitely more of opportun more opportunities. So I think at the moment, no, we haven't, uh, we haven't written anything with an exclusion um, um, an exclusion for collision. If there's any insurer out there who loves um, collision, I'm quite happy to, they can write reinsurance on, and we can fack out the collision if they really think that there's no risk at all. That would be great and that would be easy for them. Um, in terms of liability, um, with the insurance policy that we issue, that everyone issues, is very broad. It's an all risks policy. So it, it's covering, you know, workmanship, design, uh, operations, uh, the environment. So anything in the environment, coronal mass ejections, meter strike, debris. So really what you're going to, what we're going to be faced with is someone's going to come to us and say, you know, we suspect we've had a collision, but the, the end result is our spacecraft is either no longer there or it's no longer working. Please pay the claim. So in the first instance, we're going to have to pay the claim. Could we subrogate? Could we go and find out which, which debris hit the spacecraft? Where was that generated from, etc.? It's unlikely that that's, that is feasible, that when we did establish, if we were able to establish, that that would stand up in, in, in the courts, whether we could pursue someone overseas, I think that's a dead end and probably a waste of time and money, ultimately. Okay. That um, uh, Adam, there are a couple of questions here that uh, deal with new technologies. There's a question about uh, our launch insurance prices increasing due to new launchers and how do you plan to tackle space tourism? Given that Marsh has done a lot of work, uh, both with new launchers and with space tourism, why don't you go ahead and talk about uh, how that's affecting the market and where you see things going? Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, so new launches will inevitably, um, certainly in their first few launches, pay a higher rate, but that's more related to the, the historical reliability um, of, of new launches and the fact that there's less uh, heritage in that technology. Um, the, the premium rate increases on a market level are more driven by the market profitability in terms of the claims versus the premium. Um, so you, you, the, the rating factors is really a combination of the market itself and the individual risk profile as a baseline against that market. So the new launch vehicles initially will be higher than the standard uh, risk profile because they don't have that history. And I think, Chris, you, you have some stats that show that over 30% of the first two launches of a launch vehicle fail. So it is obviously at the risky end of the business, but those we would expect those premium rates to come down uh, relatively quickly as more uh, successful launches are shown on a, a launch by launch basis. And, and really by you know, seven to 10 successful launches, you know, you'll be back down to the baseline level, uh, maybe just a little bit of, uh, above some of the, the, the more established launch service providers. So that's more of a risk. We're, we're very um, bullish about the, the uh, <coughs> supporting the small launches. <coughs> Excuse me. We have a, a number of them on our client list and um, yeah, we, we, we see great value uh, in, in what they're doing. Uh, so a few of those are coming to launch in the next nine months or so. And so we're excited to see how that's going to happen. Um, in, in terms of the human spaceflight aspect, yeah, this is a really innovative area. You know, it's great that you know, it's an, an area of the industry um, and that is growing. And therefore, as an insurance market, I think we are innovating to kind of expand the pie of, of, of space insurance, which is great. Uh, there's still a lot of work to be done on the human spaceflight aspect, and it's being done right now. I mean, it's predominantly... Uh, being looked at in the um, aviation liability market, but your capacity is, is tough. And, and typically with the insurers that have a space 
a team, a space underwriting team like Chris or, or Richard to, to help um, complement the, the aviation liability team with, with space related um, knowledge. But there are other marketplaces you can go into, uh, travel accident even uh, for low limits of uh, injuries. So, uh, but it's, a, it's, it's, it's a tough work at the moment, we're, we're working on it. So I think it's a case of, uh, we do believe it's uh, going to be a, a promising area of insurance and, and, and we do believe the market will respond, uh, but we're kind of in the process of driving that right now. Okay, very good, thank you. In regards to the small sat insurers, in terms of uh, the, the, the 10 insurers, yeah, I'd say that there are 10 that are really proactive. Yes, you can take small sat risks to uh, not in my thought, 30 or 40 insurers that are out there. But in terms of really, you know, innovating and, and, and actively going to small sat conferences and, and engaging with clients, yeah, it, it, is, a, it is definitely a, a, a lower number. Thanks, Adam. So a few, I'll take a few questions here. Um, one question about the data that I gave on uh, the usefulness, the utility of um, um, on-orbit inspection. Um, in our, we have a very comprehensive database of uh, anomalies on geosatellites launched since 2000. But we have actually a much broader database, but the, the one that we analyze the most covers the, uh, the period from 2000 to, to present and geosatellites. And what we found is there are 85, satellite, 85 geosatellites that have suffered significant loss of capability over that time of the, say, 600 and some odd uh, geosatellites that have been launched. Of those 85 satellites, uh, we've, uh, in looking at the types of anomalies they've had, we see that about 60 of them would actually benefit from on-orbit inspections. And again, on-orbit inspection is not for us. You know, we will we'll rely on the satellite operator and the manufacturer to tell us what went wrong. Inspection can help, but it's really for the manufacturer to, to, to develop lessons learned and for the operator to, to uh, fix their, their uh, con ops for the particular mission. So we're very big fans of on-orbit inspection. There are a number of companies who are looking at it, and uh, we, we strongly encourage it. Um, there are several questions about um, the, um, the incentives that we've suggested and whether the, um, uh, the industry has responded to it. We haven't actually said, okay, if you do this, we will reduce your premium. And that's not really the way we would expect it to work. It's, as I said, um, there's, a, there's a baseline level of responsible activity. Responsible activity is the baseline, it's not the aspiration. It's not what you aim to achieve ultimately. It's really important to, to recognize that um, we would much prefer to see our clients taking every step they can within reason to uh, keep space uh, safe and uh, to act responsibly. So in our view, it's not so much that we reward those who do that, but we might decide that those who don't do it, who actively don't follow the, the, the guidelines, the rules, or what have you, maybe we would ask them why and, and consider saying something like, okay, um, to make space better for everyone, we as an insurance company do have the levers and knobs of pricing and coverage and the like. Uh, we would uh, we would like to, as as uh, as Adam and Richard both said, you know, we want to we want to support the industry, but I, I really do think that it's important for us to use our uh, position to be able to say we believe you should um, uh, act responsibly. Um, the uh, just looking at the questions here, there's a question on on cyber. Uh, any comments on insurance for cyber security? Um, I'll start off and, and please Richard and, and Adam jump in. There, there is an effort, um, in fact there is a clause that's now in um, space insurance policies that, that clarifies what coverage is offered. As Adam said earlier, our policies are all risks. In, every, in other words, they cover everything except what's ex explicitly excluded. And there's never been an explicit cyber exclusion. There are exclusions for war, for terrorism and the like. So if an act of cyber attack was deemed to be one of those, it, it could be excluded. Um, if it's something else indeterminate or if it's uh, some kid hacking on his, uh, on, his, on his computer and he manages to destroy a satellite and, we can, and that's what we can trace it to, that would, be a more, uh, that would be a more difficult situation. But the cyber clarification wording 
and there are several versions of it, but they, they, they act in very similar ways. The cyber clarification wording would hopefully uh, be there to resolve those types of uh, issues. Uh, Richard, Adam, you guys have anything on cyber? Um, I do think about cyber versus Leo versus Geo. So I think on the cyber side, I think a cyber attack on Geo is still going to be challenging. You know, Geo, Geo is in, in a Geo orbit. You probably need the resources of a country to to you know reach a spacecraft to crack the uh, encryption you know to get a command into a spacecraft to disable it to do something i i think that's potentially doable uh with a nation state and then would that be excluded under the war coverage this has been a big sort of discussion within the industry i think on the leo side i think the, the definitely the uh barrier to hacking uh participating in a cyber attack on a LEO spacecraft is probably lower. I would imagine it's probably, you know, it's definitely significantly easier, significantly easier to communicate to a spacecraft in LEO. Uh, is, the, is the level of uh, software and encryption and ground station, et cetera, is that, is that all lower? I would think so. So definitely, yeah, it's a concern. I'm very pleased with the, with the new language and the new approach that the insurance industry is taking. I think it's the, the right way forward. I did, I read something interesting. So at DEF CON, which is the, the hacker, the hacker conference, it's in Vegas every year. So it just got canceled. So it's not this year, but the uh, Air Force took a dummy GPS spacecraft, a, a, a platform uh, spacecraft on the ground and they basically opened it up to hackers. So it was one of these hacking competitions so I was really interested to see, you know, was everyone, was there any of the, the hackers at DEF CON where they were going to be able to crack a, a US GPS spacecraft? That would have been really fascinating. So maybe next year. Yeah, I, from, from my side or from, I, I think, you know, the cyber clarification has been quite challenging for the clients, actually. Um, I think I, I understand the reason for it in terms of the clarification from the LMA or the regulators. Because actually, when we asked, um, we have some customers who are typically uh, who are quite sensitive to cyber coverage. And when we asked the insurers before the clarification clause came out, you know, there was a mixture of feedback from the insurers. Some said, well, it's not excluded, so it would be covered. And others said, well, uh, yes, we understand that. But how could you hack a, a geo satellite in particular without kind of states sponsoring or, you know, to merge in towards the war or the terrorism so exclusions that could be mitigated under that. But so I understand the reason for the clarification, but some of our customers feel that actually you've taken the potential of an, a claim being paid for, for cyber and specifically uh, highlighted that it won't be for malicious acts. So that's okay. Okay. That, that, that's the way it's, it's fallen, but there is no, uh, there's no replacement for that coverage. There's, the market hasn't really mobilized to the extent of writing back. There was meant to be a, an SRC2, a write back for that coverage. And, uh, you know, some people felt that that was just trying to you know, maybe get some more, more premium. But either way, that hasn't really manifested. There are a couple of insurers that are, are, are forging the path on, on this in terms of cyber asset and liability, but it's not really there as a market option to be able to say, okay, you, you now have the cyber clarification which excludes the malicious cyber, uh, but there's no definitive right back. And I think that's a problem uh, because especially some of our customers who have corporate cyber coverage with an exclusion for space segment, you know, they now have a hole that they either didn't realize before or uh, was kind of a little bit vague in it. So yeah, I think this is an area that we as a market really need to work on and as, as, as fast as possible actually. Just to come back to Adam on that point, if I can. So I think the challenge on the cyber side is once you've identified this cyber piece and you've carved it off, it sort of then falls into the cyber market. You know, we're, at Shorespace, we utilize the Lloyds platform. It's a fantastic platform. It gives us access, it gives us security. We can play as an equal player, you know, in the market. But Lloyds is very much sort of, a, you know, lines of business are defined by codes and everyone has to stay in their lane. So once you sort of say, okay, this is the cyber risk in space, then that becomes the domain of the cyber underwriters. So it's very difficult for a space guy to then say, okay, I've got rid of the cyber piece. Okay, let me let me come and let me work with brokers, let me work with clients to understand what what systems they've got to prevent this type of attack. And then if it does happen, what systems they've got to recover from it, 
we could probably get comfortable. We could probably ride it back. But by that point, it's a cyber risk. And so I think, you know, we're looking at the cyber underwriters worldwide to come in and, and write that, that business back. So that's really how it is for us, yes. unfortunately. That's a fair point. And, and I don't disagree that that was probably the right home for it in the cyber market. But there, I mean, for a sure, obviously you have uh, your space, specifically space underwriters. Other underwriters do have cyber teams. And perhaps, you know, the, and maybe yeah. it's really happening. Like in the, the human space flight world where the space teams are supporting the, the teams in the aviation liability, uh, perhaps then some of the wider, the larger companies where they have a space team and a cyber team, you know, that's really where they can work it out and, and provide that product. And uh, agree, yeah. Okay, let me take a, a couple of questions here. One is, you know, we've talked a lot about risk. What about the, the the positive future that we see? And it's very interesting to see that in the last week, both SES and Indelsat have ordered uh, ten satellites to replace uh, their C-band capacity to um, uh, move out of the spectrum that will be used for five G. 10 satellites all to be launched within say two or three years that's that's very uh, that's very exciting for us there's a lot of good new business uh, there so we're we're pretty excited um, and even though um, the geo market has slowed down had slowed down in the last several years our feeling is maybe we're seeing the, the the bloom coming off the rose on some of the Leo constellations, either for technology reasons or competitive reasons. Obviously, Starlink is is going gung ho and and pushing that system as hard as they can. Um, so I think a lot of companies will reassess their activity. I think there's a place for Geo, there's a place for Mio, there's a place for Leo, and some companies are are exercising all three. But I think the Geo market will uh, will recover. There are several questions here about what is what can the space insurance industry do about these norms of behavior about changing regulations about about all that these things take time any sort of process involving regulation takes a lot of time and you have different uh, voices when I said there were 50 organizations looking at responsible space activity those 50 organizations uh, often have uh, opposing views on various issues. So it's not a simple matter of getting everyone to sit around at a table and say, yes, of course, this is the right thing to do. I look back to when I was young, and, and, uh, and I've told this story often, that seatbelts in automobiles were, um, when they finally developed seatbelts, they were um, an option that cost more to have. It was a, it was a, it was a premium option to have seatbelts in your car. Well, obviously, insur insurance companies and, and manufacturers realized that uh, it made driving safer and so it became uh, rather than an option it became mandatory and now we see it in all all cars obviously um so i think that process that's part of the process i'm not saying it will take a bad day in space to get people to um, decide that beacons or propulsion or a five-year deorbit rule are uh, called for but i think those are the types of um uh, things that that will happen at some point and we we need to be ready to to address those there i see that we have a number of people online from um department of commerce and from other uh, u.s government um entities and i would say you know we in the insurance business we want to work with the government we want to work with you we want to help you and show you what we can do our objective isn't simply to say ah well um you know you get a good driver discount because you are meeting the minimum standards. No, as I said, we want people who are role models, who aspire to do the most responsible things in space um, and and to uh, reward those. So, um, you know, with the uh, with the U.S. government, um, um, we and 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 foreign governments and institutions, we we look forward to working, you know, educating you on what we do and how we do it, how we look at risk. And and hopefully coming up with some some form of incentive in, incentivizing people to do the right thing. There there are various notices of proposed rulemaking out there, FCC uh, and others. And you know we want to work with those organizations to try and make sure that everyone understands what the um, what the issues really are. Um, uh, the um, I did have a, any any other comments from Richard and Adam on that, or um, we had talked about having a uh, sort of a general question about 
you know, maybe the effect of COVID, the whether that has affected your company's, um, your company's appetite for being in the space business. Any comments on that, Richard and Adam? I initially thought we would be, as an industry, somewhat immune from COVID. I think uh, in the beginning, I fell into that naivety hole and I thought, well, you know, certainly in the US, um, satellite manufacturing, launch vehicle manufacturing is sort of essential business and those businesses seem to carry on. Spacecraft typically are fully financed. They take two or three years to build. So, uh, you know, you lose a few months on the, on the manufacturing cycle. Yeah, we can claw that back. But actually, we have seen a fairly significant impact. You know, most of the launch sites were have slowed or closed. Uh, we've definitely seen a slowdown on financing of new products. You know, I think the one where bankruptcy, although it was triggered by the lack of financing and COVID, I think you know, it's probably had a bit of a death sentence hanging over it for the last few years. Um, you know, I certainly think because of the lack of launches in the last few months, actual earned premium income is probably going to be down this month. I mean, we have a, a huge amount of spacecraft that are going to be launched in the next two or three months. So um, I... Um, I'm definitely concerned about COVID, but I think overall we're somewhat okay. Yeah, the, the space market has typically been able to separate itself somewhat from the, the wider insurance um, effects because of its, um, so its remoteness to any other type of market uh, in the insurance side. But I, I wonder at some point whether the the impacts of kind of reduced um, premium uh, uh, earnings for the insurers uh, claims, obviously, you know, just general financial constrictions may fall in. We had one insurer who uh, raised a prediction in a letter that the insurance rates would increase significantly on the back of COVID. We haven't seen it yet, um, but as as Rich said, we haven't quite seen the impact of. Um, reduced premium income this year from delayed launches yet. I don't think it'll affect the demand side too much, albeit, you know, obviously some of our customers on the maritime uh, and aero in particular have, have suffered some short-term hits. So in general, I think the question is still unanswered, I'd say. We would hope not. We'd hope that the general dynamics of the space insurance market will continue to play out alone, um, but we'll, we'll wait to see. And, and fingers crossed we can keep the rates down for all of our customers as, as much possible to attract as much business into the market as possible. Thanks, Adam. Actually, and uh, one more point, Adam, I think COVID might keep the rates up because a lot of my capacity providers, they don't just, they're not space underwriters, it's space and aviation. Space and aviation is sort of this partnership within the industry and the aviation market is under a lot of pressure. The yes. aircraft are not flying, they're not paying premiums. So I, I feel that I have been very clear mandate on the space side to maintain the current rating environment because of COVID. Oh, yeah, so we're coming to the end of our time. <laughs> we, we, could, we could talk about this for a lot longer. And, and uh, uh, you know, Tony has done a great job in, in, in putting this together. I want to give each of you 15 seconds to, to say how you see things, how you want to see things going. Let's start with you, Richard, very briefly. Um, like I say, I'm very positive on space. I've been doing it my entire career. I think that the, the developments and the new business that are happening today, I think it's going to be great for insurers. I see a, I see a very uh, promising outlook. I just hope it comes up a little bit quicker. We've been promised this new wave of new SAT business over the last few years. I think it's still there. I think it's still coming. I just, I don't want to wait. I don't want to wait till retirement. I want to do it now. Okay, Adam. Uh, thanks. We've got a lot of uh, ground. I think on the new space side, we too are, are very um, bullish on that. We're putting a lot of resources towards it and we're happy to support uh, customers as they come through. In, in space in general, uh, we're very positive. And uh, I suppose that the main takeaways from uh, our, my, my side was just really to get involved early, prepare early, start talking early and take time to get the right product for yourself and, and give us a call if you need a hand with anything. Thanks, Adam. So from my point of view, I've been in this business for 36 years and, and uh, every day 
is something new. So I, I love this business. I think it has a great future. I think we're a key part of the space industry, and I'm really excited about the work that we can do in this business. I want to thank uh, Richard and Adam, um, my fellow panelists, and of course, Tony, for arranging the program. You've done a fantastic job here. Um, hopefully, we'll get lots of people reaching out to us, um, asking the questions that maybe didn't get answered. So please do that. And uh, thank you, the audience, for your attention, for your questions. And we hope you've learned uh, more about space and uh, risk and insurance. And we look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you, uh, uh, Matt List. Uh, before we, we leave, I uh, just want to thank you again uh, for uh, the session. Uh, very interesting subject. I was involved uh, for five years at OneWeb. I'm still I'm involved as well right now. Uh, I was the one initiating the uh, license uh, uh, for the UK Space Agency, the launch and operations license, and was involved also in shaping up the uh, insurance uh, requirements for uh, these uh, large constellations. I wouldn't call them mega constellations because they're not millions of satellites, but large constellations. Uh, so uh, myself and a team of other people within OneWeb and, and the, the brokers, actually, we were uh, actively pushing for a licensing regime in the UK for these large constellations. Eventually, we got something. Uh, which was very useful uh, for us in, in that respect. I, I have a, a simple question, which I, of course, I, I didn't write on the Q&A uh, box. Uh, if you keep a satellite up in space after the end of life, like, you know, the GSO will go into the graveyard and the MEOs will remain in MEO, for example, um, will you still, uh, will they'll, they still be insured against the temporary liability, for example? Good question. Or ever, for thousands of years, I suppose. They're not. Uh, as long as they pose a risk, as long as they do pose a risk, it's probably wise to have some sort of a regime that 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 takes care of that. Yeah, I, I suspect that they, they 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 may always pose a risk for the hundreds of years they remain in orbit and so forth. So, anyway, uh, so I've run a poll. Um, and most of the uh, people, uh, about fifty-five people, have already answered the poll. Thank you so much. I'm going to end the poll right now. Uh, Chris, uh, Richard, and Adam, I will send you all the Q&As uh, separately. If you would like to answer them uh, by typing them, then I will send them back to the attendees afterwards. That way, uh, each of those questions at least have been answered. If you can find the time to, um, uh, if you can find the time actually to um, answer them, and then the people will get their answers back. Thank you very much to you. Thank you also to the participants. Next week's, uh, in fact, if I can share my screen again, next week's um, panel uh, is on uh, space in Africa. Uh, it's on the screen now. Uh, the week after will be uh, ADTI, New Neutron Star. And then the week after that will be orbit servicing and so forth, situational awareness and so forth. So I hope to add all the uh, panelists um, panelists, I'm sorry, uh, the attendees uh, uh, come, come back to, to, to also uh, look at those panels in the future. Thank you very much. I'll leave you with that. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.